I'm talking about gentamicin dosing and monitoring, what the plasma concentration curve for gentamicin looks like, the concept of post-antibiotic effect and concentration dependence killing action of gentamicin, once daily dosing and why it's used versus multiple daily dosing, renal impairment, the principle behind deciding what the initial dose and the interval and taking gentamicin levels, ideal body weight versus actual body weight, and creatinine clearance. These are all going to be timestamps in the description below. Gentamicin is an aminoglycoside antibiotic which targets the 30S ribosomal unit of the bacteria, causing inhibition of protein synthesis, which ultimately leads to cell wall damage. The well-known effects of nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity occur with overdose or overexposure. And drug monitoring via taking levels is a big thing with gentamicin and other aminoglycosides. Gentamicin works synergistically with other antibiotics, um, in particular the beta-lactams, which also target the cell wall of the bacteria. It targets a select few but important pathogens, including Staph aureus, E. coli, and Pseudomonas. This is a plasma concentration curve for gentamicin, and it's a standard exponential first-order decay curve. So on the left-hand side, you've got the plasma concentration, and then here is where you inject the dose. If you're giving a small dose, then it can be given as a bolus injection. If you're giving a large dose, then it needs to be infused over one hour. And then once the dose has been administered into the body, um, it starts to be eliminated renally straight away. This is a classic first order kinetics curve where the rate of elimination is proportional to the drug concentration. In other words, the, the higher the drug concentration in the blood, the faster the rate of elimination. And as the drug concentration goes down, then the rate of elimination also goes down. And then you get this classic um, exponential decay curve. The half-life of gentamicin in a person with normal kidney function is two to three hours. I've drawn it out here using a T half of two hours. This means that every two hours, the drug concentration goes down by a half. In this example, the peak is at 12 milligrams per liter. Um, two hours later, so that's like hour three, the concentration has gone down to six milligrams per liter. And another two hours later, it's gone down to three milligrams per liter and so on. The levels of gentamicin are almost zero by around hour 12, which means almost all of it has been cleared from the body at this stage. An important feature of aminoglycosides and gentamicin are that they have a post-antibiotic effect. This is where the killing effect of the antibiotic persists even after it has been cleared from the body. So now let's talk about once daily dosing versus multiple daily dosing. So this is the dosing given over 24 hours with the multiple daily dosing. In this case, it is one dose every eight hours or three times a day. So with gentamicin, you want the peak to be at least 10 times the minimum inhibitory concentration. And it works out that after around eight hours, it's pretty much underneath the MIC and you can, it's pretty much almost zero. So then you can give a second dose. And after another eight hours, you give another dose. Monitoring for multiple daily dosing requires taking peak levels and trough levels to make sure that the peaks and troughs are in your target ranges. So now let's compare that to the once daily dosing, which is shown as the blue peak. So notice how there is a large drug-free interval between when the first dose is cleared and when the next dose is given. Here is when the post-antibiotic effect takes over, so during this interval, the killing effect is still occurring without any drug in the body. You do have to dose quite high to begin with in order to have that um, enhanced and prolonged antibiotic effect to last over the drug-free interval. The killing effect of gentamicin is also concentration dependent, so that means the, the bigger the dose you give, the, the more effective the gentamicin becomes at killing off the bacteria. To recap, with the once daily dosing, you are giving one massive daily dose and the large dose gives an enhanced killing effect and an enhanced post-antibiotic effect and allows you to give the body a drug-free interval before the next dose is given 24 hours later. 
and with the multiple daily dosing you're giving smaller doses but more frequently effectively giving the body continuous exposure to the gentamicin. Once daily dosing versus multiple daily dosing has been compared and studied extensively over the years and it's been concluded that they're both equally as effective as each other. With the once daily dosing, there's actually less instance of nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity occurring. So this led to the conclusion that the toxic events weren't related to how high the peak was, it was more to do with the length of exposure the body had to the um, amino glycoside. So whilst multiple daily dosing was the traditional way of dosing gentamicin, nowadays uh, once daily dosing is the standard way to give gentamicin and you'll, you'll only see multiple daily dosing under specific circumstances. So let's talk about gentamicin and renal function. Gentamicin is almost 100% cleared renally. In this illustration, you can see the blue peak is the clearance of a patient with normal kidneys. The, the, the dotted line is the gentamicin clearance of a patient with impaired renal function. And you can see at 24 hours, um, 24 hours after the first dose, their gentamicin levels are still pretty high. And you, you don't want to give them another dose at this point. You want to wait for the gentamicin le levels go down to zero and actually also give them a drug-free interval as well before you give them the next dose. And the dotted line is something you are more likely to see in um, elderly people. Elderly people are, are more likely to have reduced renal function. The gentamicin curve is a very predictable first-order kinetics curve. Um, once you take a level and you know what time you've taken the level, it's fairly, fairly straightforward to work out when the gentamicin levels will go down to zero. So let's talk about how the initial dose is calculated. Five to seven milligrams per kilogram of the patient's weight is typically what's seen in literature. This varies from hospital to hospital. Some hospitals might want, to, might want you to give less than five milligrams per kilogram. There is a maximum amount you can give a patient. So typically it's something like 400 to 500 milligrams. So this applies to big patients with normal renal function, you would only give them a maximum of something say like 500 milligrams to avoid giving too much gentamicin to them. Care needs to be taken with dosing patients who are overweight. So the thing with the patients who are overweight is that gentamicin doesn't distribute well into adipose tissue. What's generally done is um, ideal body weight is calculated and then you dose them according to their ideal body weight rather than their actual body weight because if you dose them according to their actual body weight then you might accidentally give them um, toxic amounts of gentamicin. You don't need to calculate ideal body weight for patients who are normal weight or underweight. Um, for these patients you just you can just dose them according to their actual body weight. You can manually calculate ideal body weight using a standard formula and then there are lots of ideal body weight calculators on the internet as well. You can also use to cross-reference. Once you decide on what initial dose you're going to give the patient, the next thing you need to decide on is the interval. For a person with normal renal function, the standard interval is 24 hours. If the patient has impaired renal function, then you do need to um, increase the interval to 36 hours or 48 hours. The standard way of determining or confirming the interval that's going to be used is by measuring the patient's gentamicin plasma levels after they've been given a dose of gentamicin and you need to record the time that you do this as well. Um, a lot of places they take level 24 hours later so something like 30 minutes before giving the next dose and then some hospitals prefer that you take a level sooner than that so maybe something like 7 to 12 hours after giving the first dose it'll give you an idea of where on the curve you are so once you get the level and the time you took the level you can then use one of these charts so this is called a nomogram and there's like different nomograms out there. This particular one is the Hartford nomogram. We'll say, for example, you took a level at 11 hours after giving the dose 
and the concentration of gentamicin was 5 micrograms per mil, so using this chart, give the next dose at 36 hours later. And you would take a, another level just before giving the next dose at 36 hours, just to make sure that all the gentamicin is actually gone from the body. Here is a chart I have taken off a hospital guideline I found on the internet. So in this case, uh, you can use the patient's weight and creatinine clearance, and they've already charted out suggested doses and intervals. You would still be expected to take levels though. And some hospitals may also have their own calculators to calculate dose and interval. So basically what I'm trying to say is that different hospitals may have their own methods of determining dose and interval. So you do need to check their guidelines too but hopefully you can see that they are all variations of the same basic principles. So let's talk about how renal function is normally estimated for gentamicin dosing and what creatinine and what creatinine clearance is. I'm just going to be using this chart from the National Kidney Foundation to illustrate what, so what we mean by renal function. This um, is meant to be used for patients with chronic kidney disease, um, but you can see different types of renal function. So for example, at stage one, your renal function is almost 100%, so it's pretty much like minimal renal impairment. And then this goes down to stage five, where your renal function has gone down to 15%, and that at this stage, you have kidney failure, and then you have all the stages in between. And they use glomerular filtration rate, so that's the GFR, to determine what your renal function is. The thing is, it's not that straightforward to measure GFR directly. A quicker way to estimate um, renal function is by calculating creatinine clearance instead. Creatinine is a waste product produced from the muscles and is eliminated by the kidneys. So basically, if, if a person has renal impairment, um, you would expect to see their creatinine levels go up because it's accumulating in the body. But we can't just use their creatinine levels because creatinine levels are just naturally higher in men because men have more muscle mass than women. A larger person is going to have more muscle mass than a smaller person. And also, um, as you age, your muscle mass also goes down. So you need to get the creatinine levels, which is done via a simple blood test. And then you need to convert that creatinine value into a creatinine clearance value. And this is a cheap and rapid way of estimating renal function. The traditional and most commonly used way is by using the cockcroft galt equation. You can see the cockcroft galt equation takes into account the patient's age, their weight, and if they're male or female. There are some limitations, so because it's based on muscle mass, maybe you may not want to use it in patients who are very old and frail, patients who have amputations, in patients who are overweight, their weights may not be an accurate representation of their muscle mass. And just so that you know, the cockcroft galt equation is pretty old. There are newer equations um, out there now, but the cockcroft galt is the easiest one for people to remember and just manually calculate an estimated creatinine clearance. And it's kind of a way to just roughly assess the patient's renal function to help you decide on your initial dose and what interval um, to use. And, and then later on, you're gonna take levels to adjust the dosage and interval if needed to anyway. There are creatinine clearance calculators online. Here's an example of one from MD Calc. So the nice one about this is that the, the, they have some reference ranges for, for the creatinine. You can also add in the patient's height. They'll use this to calculate an ideal body weight if, if required. So I'm just gonna st stick in some average values for creatinine. See that they've got different values. So the first one is showing the calculated creatinine clearance using the, the actual body weight. The second one is where they calculated the clearance using ideal body weight. 73 mils per minute and 76 mils per minute, it's not that big, big a difference because in this case the patient is overweight. And here I am playing around with creatinine values, so if your creatinine levels are high, your creatinine clearance, it's gone down here. You can play around with these figures yourself See, as the age goes up, the creatinine clearance goes down. The overweight patient, there's quite a big difference between the creatinine clearances calculated. 
Impact also has their own creatine clearance calculator. One nice thing about this page is that it's got the Cockcroft Galt's formula written down here. You can make up some ages and weights and heights and just manually practice calculating creatinine clearances yourself and then you can use this calculator to check your answers. So this is the salazar Corcoran formula. Yeah, so this formula takes into account patients who are morbidly obese. 